This presentation is a general guide for state directors and event supervisors that are involved with the Reach for the Stars event for National Science Olympiad for the competition, competition year of 2017. It is focused on the logistics of actually setting up and running the event, not so much on the content, but just how to develop the event, the logistics of the room, the writing of the event, and how to access the resources that have been uh, developed for you to use to assist you in this. The um, event is sponsored and supported by, again, still the NASA Astrophysics Division through the Chandra X-ray Observatory. It is a for more formal partnership now with the NASA's Astrophysics Division Universe of Learning outreach program that involves astrophysics and STEM literacy. And the, the partnership with Science Olympiad, National Science Olympiad, is now much more formal than it was. And therefore, that gives us the um, time and energy to devote most of our efforts into supporting the space science events for National Science Olympiad, both Reach for the Stars and Astronomy. So the Chandra X-ray Observatory has posted the webinars for 2017. They are up. There are eight um, YouTube modules, and it gives a general overview of the content and the resources for teams and coaches. However, it's also very useful for event supervisors, too, to access those webinars. The webinars are posted on the Chandra website, and the PowerPoints that support them along with uh, links on the notes page of those PowerPoint slides are posted on the National Science Olympiad website. So you can access them there, download the PowerPoint. There is also on the Chandra website along with the, with the webinar, there's also a transcript. So all of those resources will tell you the content, uh, description of all the deep sky objects, and all the resor resources that are necessary to access for the 2017 competi competition. So the Reach for the Stars event um, is exactly the same as it was for this year's competition, the 2016 competition in Menominee. It is still Stellar Evolution, focused on the star formation, the beginning of the process, and supernovas, the other end of the process, though it's kind of hard to get from the beginning to the end without going through the middle. But most of the focus is on star formation regions and the actual supernova events. So there is always a, um, always it, it states specifically in the event description the entire electromagnetic magnetic spectrum because it's important for teams uh, to understand the processes that are involved with these stellar evolutionary sequences and what's going on within the object to cause it to do what, it, what it's doing as it, as it evolves, as, as, as it changes over time. So event supervisors need to keep that in mind as you're developing the event to make sure that you have objects from different wavelengths. And there are some really good resources that I will show you that will help you, as well as the teams, to understand the different wavelengths involved. It's very important, the, the different wavelengths. So the event parameters for Reach for the Stars is each team can bring two 8.5 by 11 pieces of paper with information on both sides, from any source, in any form. They can have words, text, images, graphs, charts, whatever they want on those two pieces, two-sided of paper, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. Sometimes uh, with like invitationals or regionals or state competitions, they like to take advantage of a uh, planetarium or a star lab 
if that happens, if you're in a situation where the um, th that is going to happen and teams would need to have a clipboard and a little red light for the experience, then the state director or the event uh, the event coordinator would have to let you know that so make sure if, that you know if that's going to be a possibility because then you would expect kids to bring in also a clipboard and a red light. So the event for Reach for the Stars is divided into two sections. The first one is all on Constellation Star and Deep Sky Object Identification. And the second part is more concentrated on stellar evolution, spectroscopy, stellar classification of stars, the different wavelengths, looking at these deep sky objects in, in different wavelengths, the physical properties of stars, uh, such as their temperature, their radius, their luminosity, a little bit of mathematics, the distance modulus, the inverse square law. These were all identical, all identical event description to last year. So students who competed last year already have a real head start for the 2017 competition. And all of that is in the rules description in the manual. Now, the notes, though, those notes can be used for the entire competition. They can use them for part one with just star constellation and deep sky object identification, and they can use them for the second part of the event that is more related to just stellar evolution. There, uh, there are uh, event supervisors. Uh, there are a few changes from last year in the deep sky objects and the constellations and some of the stars. There have maybe two or three constellations were taken out and the same amount added, but most of the deep sky objects and the constellations are identical to last year. So if you are an event supervisor that wrote this event last year, you're good to go. You only have to change out a few of, of the objects and to, to write your event. So it should be easier for you to get started this year. For uh, those of you that are involved with choosing and selecting the room, wherever the, the host site is for the competition that the event, um, the state director has, is working with, and you have, will have a coordinator there, event coordinator, um, they should um, have an idea of what kind of facilities are needed for this particular event. Now it is a, mostly a pencil and paper event, but the students are going to have a lot of paperwork. They're going to have a lot of, of image sets and um, constellation charts and sky charts and things like that, um, that that are on the pages within the event, plus their two pieces of paper. So they need to have room to spread out these materials to work. So make sure that the teams have a room with adequate space to work. Um, you know, a, a desk, one of the desks that just one small little place to put a piece of paper and write really isn't enough room to be comfortable and you want the teams to be as comfortable as possible during competition. You need to have um, helpers, two to three at a minimum. Um, you can have too many helpers, but you need at least two or three minimum because you need to run this event efficiently. Everybody has to come in, have the exact same amount of time to compete as every other team, and leave. And if you have different sections, if you have 10 teams during the first time frame, and then another 10 teams, and another 10 teams, every one of those teams has to start at the exact same time, have the exact same time to do that event. If you're late getting started with the first group, and then um, the next group comes in and they have an extra couple or three minutes of time that the first group of teams didn't have, that gives them an edge. They could fill in two or three more answers during that time and get a higher score because of it. So you have to make sure that you get them in quickly. You need a helper to ensure that, that they're, they're legal to be in there, that they have their name tag or their wrist badge or whatever they have at that particular 
competition, uh, get them seated right away where you want them to be, and then uh, you, you need people to be uh, cognizant of any team that might have a question and have their hand up. You need to get to them as soon as possible to answer that question. You, if you have, if you're lucky enough to get assistants that are knowledgeable about Reach for the Stars and astronomy, that is really great. You can go over the event with them before the event, show them the questions, show them the answer key, uh, show them everything so they have a good idea, um, so they can answer questions. They might be able to answer some of the student, the team's questions without involving you because you're probably sitting there scoring already if you're with the second group of teams. So make sure that you do have helpers to assist you with. If you're using a PowerPoint slide or, or a laptop or any kind of technology yourself to run the event, make, and make sure if you're not familiar with, with the site where you'll be running this event, it's good to get there really early so you can get set up. Make sure, you know, you get through the firewalls if you need the internet for whatever you are doing. Um, so there's a lot of things to take into consideration when there's technology involved. And it's a good idea anyway to be in the room at least an hour before the competition so you can decide where teams are going to set. You could put all of the events upside down at the, at the spaces exactly where you want them to sit, how you want them to be spread out. Um, so that they can begin working immediately when you say it's time to begin. And it's helpful to have your, your helpers or at least one person responsible for keeping track of time so that every now and then they can say, you know, 45 minutes left, 30 minutes left, whatever, to give them an idea of time because some of them uh, have no clue how much time has gone on. They're so involved with doing the event.